Squashing the Market podcast with Bill Ullman. I am delighted to get this podcast back up and running during COVID from my new home based studio in Brooklyn, New York. I am pleased to welcome Bruce Cameron, the co founder of Berkshire Global Advisors and head of its wealth management practice. For nearly four decades, Bruce and his partners at Berkshire have managed to build one of the leading advisory firms in the specialized and rarefied world of asset and wealth manager mergers and acquisitions. Bruce is an ideal person to help restart and kickstart this podcast series as we go through this pandemic and try to understand the undercurrents and trends roiling the investment world. Can't imagine anyone more knowledgeable or better connected to money managers from global giants to specialized boutiques. Before founding Berkshire back in 1983, Bruce worked in the strategic planning department of Payne Weber. He is a graduate of Trinity College and the Harvard Business School. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you, Bill. I'm delighted to be here. It's a pleasure. Great. Well, let's get started. Maybe you could take us through your journey into finance and into advising money managers. My pleasure. Yeah, when I got got out of uh, college, I knew pretty much that I wanted to go into finance and I ended up taking a job in the insurance industry of all places with strategic planning with Prudential, realized that probably wasn't the ultimate right home for me. And then going back to business school, quickly got exposed to the investment banking world. And between a summer year at uh, Payne Weber and then coming back after graduating, I got involved in the strategic planning side of Payne Weber. One thing I realized is that in the brokerage industry, the investment banking industry, if you're overhead, you become expendable in downturns. So I figured I'd better start being a producer rather than overhead and had an opportunity um, fairly early on to work with a senior banker and the sort of senior executives at Payne Weber itself to look at acquisitions for that firm. And we ended up making charity firms, but looked a lot at the investment management industry at that point. And that ended up resulting in my teaming up with the senior banker who'd been involved in leading that process and setting up Berkshire, at that time, Berkshire Capital Corp, now Berkshire Global Advisors. So it was a little bit of an opportunity that came up while I was there, but uh, I I realized that this was an interesting industry, which I can tell you I anticipated all the changes, but uh, (laughs) at least I was smart enough not to to turn away. So you were a pretty young person back then, and... (laughs) I'm not going to say that about myself uh, today, for sure, but we, we were all younger back then. This was almost right. four decades ago. Correct. And and you made a very entrepreneurial move from a more, even though you saw the risks in being in the wrong place during a downturn, you still had to start a company. What gave you the confidence to do that? I felt like there was likely to be a fair amount of activity in the sector, I would be uh, remiss in not mentioning that my wife was also working. And so I had the protection on the downside that if I, I screwed up, I probably wouldn't go uh, homeless. But it was just there was there seemed to be a fair amount of activity and there was no one else focusing on this sector. And that was one of the things that Bruce McEver, who was my co-founder, and I realized is that when we were doing this looking for Payne Weber, there was really no one to help us, no one who could advise on this. And we felt there was likely to be some activity in this area. Um, So that that gave us the confidence to go go ahead and try it. And when you say likely to be some activity, what was going on at the industry at the time? What were the ingredients there that gave you that idea? This was the time when, uh, you know, the brokerage firms were starting to get more involved in the investment management industry. And it was a time when uh, they were starting to add cash management to their business as they were trying to manage sort of the cash balances where that historically had been outsourced. They were starting to build their mutual fund businesses. It was a time when institutional asset management was becoming more prominent. The the broker terms weren't as focused on that, but, but you could see other organizations looking to build in that arena. And so we saw that there was an interest in the fund business by many of the organizations, then hoping to distribute their own product, uh, a world that has changed dramatically since then. But also, you know, there was a, a movement towards investment council firms and building that business that has, has come a long way as well. But there were a number of things that starting to indicate that people were looking to have money managed professionally and that this was becoming more of a business and not just a practice. This is the first podcast I'm doing during the COVID pandemic since it started. Describe what it's like running a firm today. You have offices and personnel in London and Australia, all over the United States. 
what's worked for you during this time and what's been really difficult? Uh, it's interesting, Bill. I, um, I, I would have, if you'd asked me back in March, I'd have said we were going to have real problems. The idea of not meeting with people directly in this industry where it's so much about the people I thought was going to be very difficult. I've been proved wrong, <laughs> so I'm eating my words. But you know, some of the difficult aspects with the global side is that we've been working really hard to try and keep the various teams interacting regularly and communicating. Historically, you know, several of the partners traveled to the other offices, and the, and the principals of those offices would come to New York, and that hasn't been possible um, over the past you know eight or nine months. I think we've built on the culture that we've had, but we've worked really hard at trying to make sure that. The various team, you know, teams interact quite a bit, and uh, the, I give a lot of credit to our bullpen, which is working with the different offices and supporting them in projects, but also just on a regular communications program, video conferences that have kept us in regular contact, some of it on business, but frankly, some of it just on other matters that allow us all to talk about what's going on in the world. So that's that's worked pretty well for us. How have you dealt with recruiting and cultural aspects of keeping the firm on the same page and instilling values in your even the more junior people at the company we've worked hard at, at consistently staying out and talking to people we when we went through all this we added our new team that was to join the new hires that we'd made last fall to join this this past summer and that you know I think went over well with a lot of the team we've worked and, and again I give the team a lot of credit in terms of the uh, entry program for people. We've set up a lot of virtual discussions about some of the training things we've done. We set up virtual training programs so that it's been done very heavily with video discussions as opposed to in person. And we've set up again some, you know, conversations. There have been sort of end of week, you know, sort of happy hours, if you will, where everyone voices a beer or something like that. But, you know, it's just to talk about what's going on or what's going on in the world as opposed to strictly on business. And that's that sort of very regular conversation and interaction has helped. I, I would be less than honest if I didn't say I'm hoping that there will be the ability to do some in-person meetings and some of the staff are now coming into the office. But frankly, um, people have worked really well in terms of staying in touch. And because the staff, I think, is comfortable in working wherever they are, some you know back in New York, but many still working from remote locations, I think it's made them more at ease with that whole process as well. So we, we've just worked really hard at, at sort of educating the new groups about who we are and how we operate. And that seems to have worked pretty well. Let's talk about technology for a moment. One of the themes of this podcast is financial technology. You see it in your clients. You have to deal with it running a business. How has technology impacted your firm and your work and then also the investment management industry overall? It's it's had a huge impact, uh, no surprise. Uh, you know, I, I think back to the early days when we started this business, and, and it's embarrassing to say that the junior people still laugh at me when I say this, but we were really just starting to get spreadsheets when we started this firm, and now they're sort of an automatic. But, you know, it, it ranges in a lot of different ways. It ranges from the way we, we sort of pass information back and forth. Again, automatic these days, but now you you know you're sending emails back and forth with documents, with spreadsheets, with things like that that goes back and forth you know regularly with people as opposed to being mailed or faxed. People communicate throughout the day, throughout the night. You know, one aspect of the world which we're all familiar with is the fact that you know th- there's there's almost no downtime for a lot of these people. If a client sends you something at nine in the evening or ten in the evening, they they generally expect a response not tomorrow, tonight. And, and so there's that aspect of communication has been important. Uh, there's been, I think, a, a real ability in terms of the analytics as well. The, the sort of whole technology aspect has made us more effective in terms of running a lot of the analytics that we do in terms of drawing in information from a variety of different sources that perhaps in the past would have either been entered manually or wouldn't have been available. So that has, I think, upgraded the quality of the analytics that we do and you, know, you can argue about garbage in, garbage out, but I think we're very careful about what we're adding to our models. So there, there's just a whole range of areas where the technology has made us more fluid, more efficient in terms of how we operate. For the industry, for the investment industry, it, it's 
also just been a huge impact. You know, and you think about the way they're distributing investment products, the way that they're running their own analytics, the way they're they're managing their businesses, and similar sorts of impact on on those firms. Generally, I argue I think fees are coming down to some degree in many of these categories, but a lot of it has been adding services and and. We see that with whether it's wealth managers or institutional managers, that they have to cover a broader range of topics, that they're having to provide greater information to their clients. Um, and all those things are facilitated by the technology that they bring to bear, whether it's an artificial intelligence, an investment process, or their communications capability. Technology just played a huge role. The M&A world is what you focus on. And it's riddled with transactions that have worked and transactions that have not worked. As you know, you've been part of, I'm sure, both sides of that equation. What larger transactions can you point to, whether you worked on them or not, are examples of successful deals? And why do you think they worked? And what role do advisors play in in helping those transactions work or not work? You know, there there have been a number of transactions that have worked. You're right. There are certainly plenty that have blown up or been been mistakes. We keep trying to learn, so I'm hoping we'll have fewer and fewer where we're the advisor on something that did not work. I, you know, one that I look at, uh, I've referenced, was the Eaton Vance acquisition of Parametric, which has basically become the engine behind uh, Eaton Vance. You know, and I think that was one where Eaton Vance allowed Parametric to sort of maintain a lot of their sort of culture and their style and and basically supported the growth of that business. And if you, you know, look at it, even to this day, Parametric remains an independent brand. They operate out of Seattle instead of Boston, and they've, and they've grown that business tremendously. And Eaton Vance has been supportive. They've you know, encouraged that type of, you know, the tax or- orientation that they have, and they've invested in that business as Parametric was looking to add on capabilities. Eaton Vance provided the capital support to do that. You know, I think about Franklin. They've done several acquisitions, and you can think about Templeton, you know, way back when. And, and listen, they don't have all the people that Templeton brought with them. Um, obviously, John Templeton's no longer around, but it brought them a, a, a sort of different capability and a brand um, that I think was a plus for them. They also acquired a firm called Fiduciary Trust, which is a wealth manager. And Fiduciary Trust, you know, was in the World Trade Center and, and frankly was a firm that could have been decimated in the context of that. And Franklin supported them and throughout that entire process. And Fiduciary is not huge, but it continues to grow very successfully for Franklin Resources and the wealth management side. So there are a variety of different players like that. You know, in terms of uh, what role does the advisor play? I think part of it is thinking about what's the right strategic fit for people. And that's probably the key thing a lot of investment bankers tend to think about is does you know a certain capability, a certain style fit with the, the objectives of, of someone who's trying to make an acquisition. But I think in this industry, another very important thing is thinking about the cultural fit in terms of the organizations and whether the people will come together. And that's where, you know, I think good advisors, if they know their client, if it's on the buy side or they know their client on the sell side, they're thoughtful about how they put those things together. Um, because when I look at this industry where t- things tend to blow up, it's because either someone comes in and tries to change a business dramatically. Um, I think there's the old comment about you know, trying to change your spouse when you marry them. You know, it, It's generally a difficult thing to do. They may evolve with you, but you're not you can't just come in and say, okay, I didn't like the way you did this. And, and that's, I think that's true in these asset management businesses. You need to make, get comfortable with who and what they are and then be supportive of that and grow it. And I think good advisors help their clients to work through that as opposed to just glossing over it and focusing only on the numbers. And yet valuation is always a key aspect of any transaction. And how do you make sure your clients, when you're on the buy side, are not overpaying for a deal when it's a very important, maybe strategically important target for them. And conversely, if you're on the sell side, how do you extract the greatest value for your clients there? I think part of that's just trying to be really true to what you think are the, the circumstances and the facts and, and working through it with the client. And you know, to a certain degree, transactions these days are impacted by the efficiencies. And I would tell you that you know, 20 years ago, that was far less of a driver. It was more about growth opportunities. But trying to help your client really appreciate what is realistic and feasible and not going beyond that. So with our buy side clients, we try to make sure that we're very focused on 
thinking through what they can actually do with the business, what's the right time frame, you know, if there are any efficiencies from you know which side they'll come. You know, there's a typical thinking that if you're buying someone, if you're cutting people, that the other side loses people. And that, you know, what you should be thinking about is where are the best people coming from for the overall organization. If that means that your own organization is is cutting some staff, that you should be open to thinking about that. You know, the the other thing is that these tend to be long-term transactions. There are some where people write a check up front and that's the only compensation that, that happens. But the vast majority of transactions in this industry involve some sort of additional payments, earnouts, payouts, or things like that. One of the things that we try to get our clients to think about buy side or sell side is if you can get the right partner and the right metrics around that, Maybe that the upfront check is less important than what the overall value is if you're comfortable with it. You know, I'll never forget we went through a process with a an international manager. This was 15 or 20 years ago, and they were very focused initially on some of the big international firms that might buy their business. And we introduced them to a firm called Leg Mason. It's a guy named Chip Mason there, and he ended up being the best fit. His upfront number wasn't as high as a couple of the Swiss institutions had offered. But the seller was most comfortable that with that business, they'd be able to grow their business. And, and the earnout that they achieved in that case was um, very uh, considerable um, and very happy. You know, parametric when they sold the advance. There was a lot on, it, on the earnout side of that. I was reading an article the other day that was sort of citing some of that. It was amusing for me to read. People actually could still find those facts. But, you know, the earnout in that deal um, for the team at parametric was way, way more than the initial payment. And that was because it really worked. And so it, it's a little bit of education of the, the client about this earnout process and what the upside is and, and the risks might be. Exactly. Exactly. And sometimes they don't want to take the risk. That's fine. But you try to help them think about what's the best thing in the circumstances. We've been in a low interest rate environment now in this country pretty much since the global financial crisis back in 2008. Rates ticked up and then now they're back down again. What role has that played in the investment industry overall? What role has that played in the M&A world and being able to finance deals, et cetera? It's been this uh, fairly significant underlying impact on the world. And and it tends to get glossed over a lot because it's kind of in the background. But think about it, almost every brokerage firm, investment firm had a cash management fund 25 years ago. And a lot of that's really been centralized now as people have been unable to sort of make anything go. And if rates ever kick back up, the, you know, the profitability of a few firms is going to go through the roof potentially because of the cash management businesses that they have. But for now, it's not generating a lot of income for them. You know, that, that's tend to push people into other products. It's, it's made, you know, you can think about whether it's equity products that have a dividend aspect to them or people going into a lot of these alternative uh, credit strategies are people investing in areas where there are still decent returns, but by they're having to buy whether it's commercial real estate backed process or credit card loans or whatever it is, you see uh, some of the large institutions investing in those as a way to get income. So that's that's had a significant impact in terms of legitimizing, I suppose, and, and making appealing a lot of these alternative credit strategies that in the past were relegated to sort of the background. You know, in terms of, of what's happened in the industry as well, you know, I was having a conversation just the other day with a client where leaving their capital on the balance sheet, earning effectively very little because if it's invested in cash or in short term, has probably also encouraged a certain amount of the M&A. As people think about what they're doing with their capital base as institutions. It, you know, if they're investing it on the in treasuries or whatever and getting one or two percent, it's a little hard to justify that. So they can either buy back equity or they can look at doing strategic transactions. So I think the M&A business, certainly in our sector, has been helped a little bit by the fact that interest rates are low and a lot of the larger institutions are thinking they're better off investing in, in trying to grow their business than just letting it sit on the balance sheet when there's uncertain times. You know, this past year, we had a lull in the market for basically a month or two. And, and it's sort of come roaring back in terms of people looking at things. And I think in part, 
you know, leaving capital on the balance sheet wasn't appealing. Are you starting to see a rise of the the kind of roll up strategy that was very popular for a while? The United Asset Management type companies that can borrow money relatively inexpensively now and just buy these businesses at decent multiples, or is that strategy proven to be problematic? Uh, you, know, you can see the sort of unwinding, I suppose, of Brightsphere, you know, which is, I suppose, going all the way back to the old United Asset Managers, if you take it all the way to its history. And AMG's had a little bit more difficulty, although I, I'm not count them out. I think they're still a very effective firm. But where you're seeing is there's a lot of roll-ups in the wealth management sector right now. I think what the focus has changed in, you know, if you go back 20 years, the focus on roll-ups or multi-boutiques was really on the institutional sector. And that's probably a little tougher right now. But where you are seeing uh, sort of this interest is in wealth management. You're also seeing it to a certain degree in, in alternatives. So the, people like Dial and Peters Hill and Blackstone has a, a vehicle for this as well. And you're seeing others that are starting up now. I think Navigator, backed by Dial, is doing, you know, focusing on smaller alternative managers. But there are a variety of these sort of um, pooled, you know, vehicles or roll-ups, if you will, that are focused either on the alternative sector, where they're generally doing minorities, which given the dynamics of the business probably makes sense, where you're seeing it on the wealth management side, where there's a huge number of these smaller wealth management firms and a lot of them being rolled up, whether it's focus or cap trust or, or creative planning or others. The asset management business itself can be invested in by the public, right? You have publicly traded companies out there. My quick analysis is that we've seen multiples and valuations come down, even though the stock market itself seems to be flirting with record highs. What is going on with asset manager valuations today? What, what are you seeing out there? It's it's an interesting question. You know, part of it, I think, there are a couple of things that play into it. One, I think, a number of the firms that are public have been involved in more traditional asset categories, and some of those are under some pressure in terms of you know fees, expenses, et cetera. And so you can see some of the larger mutual fund groups that have had a little more trouble, you know, increasing their pricing. You can see to some degree in the alternative managers where you see the Carlisles and people like that. One of the aspects about them is that a material aspect of their you know, sort of income is driven by carry or, or, or sort of more volatile types of income. And it may over time add up, but there's a tendency and historically to value that type of income because it is periodic. The same way, if you look at the investment banking industry, it has tended to be valued at a lower multiple than the traditional fee income because it is, you know, the fees and the income are a little more volatile. So I, I think there's elements of that. You know, I, I think there's also just a concern about all the competition going on and how that's going to play through the industry. And so I think the, the public marketplace tends to be waiting and reserving judgment a little bit on how that industry will play out. That's great. We'll shift gears for a second. I can't avoid the question given the timing. We have this little presidential election coming up in a couple of weeks, not asking you to predict outcomes, but what, if any, are the major policy issues at stake for the investment management business overall? Is there anything on the Republican or Democrat side that anyone's pushing for? Is there anything out there that your clients and you are thinking about? Yeah, I, I would there hasn't been a lot that has been specifically targeted to the industry. There was this concept of transaction tax there, you know, that seems to have mercifully sort of receded into the background. You know, I think there's an expectation potentially that tax rates in general will go up, not, not uh, because of necessarily what we did before was wrong, but be, given the, the impact of, of COVID and the, and the deficit that we've got, there's, this is going to have to be paid for over time. We can't just keep running up debt. And so, I think there's an expectation that capital gains rates and perhaps corporate taxes will go up some as well as personal. So that's that's probably causing some people to think about doing things sooner rather than later. But, you know, counterbalancing that, I think there is an expectation if the Democrats uh, sort of proceed that international trade and things like that may be a little less burdened and that that may help the economy to a certain degree as well. So it's interesting that you know everybody has their own political orientation but other than the capital gains aspect and sort of rising tax rates uh, you know we haven't had a lot of people sort of saying i've got to do something for the following reason i think they're watching and figuring there will be some benefits if it's a, a democratic victory and there's some benefits if it's a republican victory and so we, we haven't had people sort of rushing to make decisions uh, around that one of the things that's gone on in the last 
few years that, that I've certainly noticed and, and in fact had uh, Zach Prince on here talking about uh, Bitcoin and digital assets. Are you seeing investment managers focused on this asset class? Is it an asset class yet? I mean, I, I don't know. Do you think there's a future in, in that? Interesting question. Um, my historic sense, and, and I promise you I'm not the best expert on this, but is that the governments and I think you know the IRS and, and U.S. regulation has sort of said that if this becomes too prominent, I think this will be true with some of the other governments, that there'll be efforts to step in and, and regulate this to some degree. I, I, it is it's certainly feasible that it can become a more significant asset class. I think there are some people out there that have tried to manage around this. It has, my experience, been pretty volatile so far. And so it's been a little bit this may be unfair to the asset class, like going to Las Vegas or something. But if it continues to evolve and, and frankly, centralize, I think there are several different currencies like this. I think if it became Bitcoin was the one be all and end all, then, then it may be that that will help as well in terms of this becoming a, a more regular asset class. But to date, it has been in the people that we've dealt with sort of People have looked at it, but it hasn't become a major effort. But I think you know, people are examining it and trying to understand it. And if it sort of weathers the test of time, they will become a more prominent asset class. So I always ask my guests to talk a little bit about their own investing strategies and how they manage their own personal finances. Obviously, you've been around for a while, and it'd be interesting to hear not only the asset classes and strategies you focus on, how that may have changed over time as you've aged and have different investing needs? You know, the, the financial journey is a long one. How have you managed that? What do you think about in terms of your own assets and investing strategy? Yeah, I think when I first got in the industry, I thought I could be a stock jockey. And so, you know, I, I did research on things and, and picked a few, you know, securities. And one, in the context of being in a regulated business, I've concluded that picking securities is basically a loser's game. I can't, the only industry I know much about, I can't invest in anyway. So I've, I've gotten away from that completely. And it's more about asset allocation. I, I historically had a bias towards global investing. But at this point, it's probably I, I'm invested in, in real estate for purpose or not. <laughs> Certainly more in that. And then um, I've been trying to just do sort of broad asset allocation. I use an advisor that does a lot of that, but basically in a variety of asset classes, I've probably become slightly more conservative in the last couple of years. I've moved a little bit away from the equity markets, just expecting that we'd have some volatility. But, you know, I'm generally sort of diversified sort of portfolio is my overall scheme at this point. Is it more, uh, does your advisor recommend more actively based strategies within equities and fixed income or is it more index oriented? They tend to be more index oriented um, types of things. And, you know, it, with some more exposure to probably fixed income credit strategies than historically was true, given that I unfortunately keep growing older. I suppose it could be worse. But. <laughs> So the last thing we do on my podcast is we do a thing called the lightning round. And I'm just going to ask you pairs of words and you just have to say one. You just pick one. You can pick it for any reason. You don't have to explain why, but you just have to pick one. Here we go. U.S. or emerging markets? Emerging markets. ETFs or active management? Active management. Work from home or work from office? (laughs) Work from office. Hedge funds or private equity? Private equity. Bitcoin or gold? Gold. Bruce Cameron, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed it.